Hi, I'm Marge Charmley, and I'm from St. Paul. I'm Anita Kozan, and I'm from Minneapolis. Welcome to Bi Cities, a show by, for, and about the bisexual plus community, our GLBT allies and friends, and of interest, we hope, to everyone who wants to be more compassionate. Speaking of our first guest, uh, yes. uh, we welcome you to learn more about uh, good things that are happening in Minnesota and sometimes around the world, but specifically in Minnesota tonight. And for your information, Bi Cities is the longest running show in the history of the world on bisexuality. On bisexuality. So, Dr. Marge Charmley. Well done, Dr. Kozan. Tell us about our guests this evening. Well, I am absolutely thrilled that we have two eminent guests with us tonight who are from the University of Minnesota Comprehensive Gender Care Initiative Program. And it's a wonderful program that helps people that are transgender and uh, wondering about whether or not they want to uh, avail themselves of different medical services. So we're very pleased to have with us E.J. Jack, who is the coordinator of the program, and Dr. Nicholas Kim, who is one of the surgeons there. So Welcome, E.J. and Dr. Kim. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We're absolutely thrilled. It, it's taken us a while to uh, get all the systems clear to get you on the show, but we're just thrilled to have you. So thank you for taking the time Thanks on a Friday night to film, when thank I'm sure you. there's thank lots of other us. things you could be doing. So. This is fun. This, this is, is fun, yeah. yeah. This, we all know how to have fun on a Friday night. <laughs> 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 So, well, let's start with you, E.J. You are the uh, core care coordinator for the program. So maybe you could talk a little bit about, you know, the services that you offer, maybe how people, you know, might contact you if they're interested in any of your services. So just going to let you take it away because I know you've done stuff like this before. So. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for having us. Um, so at the University of Minnesota, we have a comprehensive gender care initiative, as you mentioned. Um, I'm the transgender care coordinator. So I... Um, take phone calls and help people get access to a variety of services available at the University of Minnesota um, and across the lifespan. So we have parents calling because their children are exploring their gender and their gender diversity um, through adults that are looking to transition their care um, because of their providers or their insurance um, is changing and so they need to find a new provider. Um, so. We really see anybody that needs any gender-related care, um, whether that's mental health and um, you know, seeing a therapist at the Center for Sexual Health or hormones with one of our primary care physicians, um, voice language therapy, which is right up your alley, uh -huh. um, surgical services with Dr. Kim and, and a few other folks in urology and OB-GYN for hysterectomies, um, so really, trying to provide a comprehensive service. Um, and so folks can call in, um, and the phone number that we can be reached at is 612-676-4227. And you will inevitably have to leave a voicemail because I'm so busy, because I'm one person taking all the phone calls. Okay. Um, but then I really just do a quick assessment and determine where the person is at in their transition, and then try to get them the resources that they need. I understand you also have dermatology on board, right? And yes, we do. I'll be interested in hearing you know, just how that fits in with all, the, all of what you do as well, because I've referred a number of people to your clinic. And, oh, yes, and, yes. Yeah. Hair removal is, a, uh, is an important process in transitioning. And uh, in my part of the surgical services, genital surgery, we have pre-genital surgery hair removal as a, a step towards surgery and uh, we partnered up with our derm colleagues and they offer laser treatment and hopefully in the future electrolysis treatment mm. and we've had some success getting our uh, treatments covered through insurance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes historically hair removal was not covered and so I think that's changing right. a little bit now then. Yes, right. yes. It is medically necessary uh, prior to undergoing phalloplasty or vaginoplasty uh, it is basically unsafe or very difficult to remove hair once we've done those surgeries. Mm -hmm. uh, to remove hair from within the urethra or from within the vagina, it's, it's nearly impossible. And so we, we would like to get that done before surgery. 
Mm -hmm. Wow, that's a whole other thing to think about. That, that of, of oh yeah, of this, here the we're scope we're of services. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there, um, this is when we were talking about all the specialties. Mm -hmm. So dermatology, plastic surgery, surgery, otolaryngology, speech and language pathology, psychology, psychology, mm -hmm. probably social work. Social work. I'm a yeah. social worker. Um, Physical therapy, uh -huh. occupational therapy, urology, um, nursing, nursing, mm -hmm. nursing. Endocrinology. Huge. Okay. endocrinology, endocrinology, um, OB gyn. OB gyn. You know, what role does um, occupational therapy and physical therapy play within the program? For our surgical services, uh, occupational therapy, uh, they do a lot of splint making. A lot of therapy when it comes to using their, our hands again after using tissue for building genitals, uh, getting people up and walking again, okay. getting them refitted back into their home environment and working at their job. Those are sort of, sort of the things that they do. They also help with making uh, certain custom braces and splints to keep uh, our tissue where the where uh, where they're supposed to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know if this would be uh, an appropriate time, but in the before we began filming, you were telling us about uh, a specialty. Well, with within plastic surgery, that that there are specialists of different parts of the body, but also that you have designed a new technique on how to. Uh, cut and essentially preserve tissue so that it can be most useful in surgery. Would that be okay yeah. if we Well, yeah, went so to we, that? we were talking about this one case. I wouldn't say I designed a new technique, All but right. um, I'm also hand trained and hand, hand surgery trained. Uh, I, one of the wrist surgeries that I do is called ulnar shortening osteotomy. It's, it's, a, it's kind of a rare thing that we do. It's done for a condition called ulnar abutment syndrome. Uh, I had a patient who perhaps would desire phalloplasty in the future, and he had done enough research online. He, had, he knew enough that taking a phallus flap from the forearm would require a large amount of skin. And so that's mm -hmm. normal that they would take skin, a surgeon would take skin from the arm to yes, create it, the it's phallus? Yes, it's one of the known ways of doing a phalloplasty, mm -hmm. one of the more reliable ways. And knowing that, and knowing that he needed an ulnar shortening osteotomy, he came to me for consultation asking where should the insert incision be placed. So could you mm -hmm. just um, let our viewers know a little bit about the anatomy so they know the ulnar and exactly oh, what yes, you're talking yes, about? Of course. The ulnar side of the forearm is the small finger side, and the radial side of the forearm is the thumb side. This is fuller, and the back would be dorsal. Mm -hmm. so so, I'm sorry, the condition that that person had was that something was interacting or With one of the carpal bones, with okay. one of the wrist bones, okay. yes. Okay, with yes. one of the wrist bones and had uh -huh. to be dealt with. Yeah, it had to be dealt with. And we had to shorten the ulna so that it wouldn't impact the, uh, the lunate, the oh, wrist okay. bone. Okay, okay, so something was growing up into a space. And so well, he, had he, to... was, he was born with a long ulna. He was yeah. born with a long uh -huh. ulna, okay, uh -huh. okay. Yeah. And so normally you would make an incision right over the ulna to get to it and to shorten it. But uh, we, we planned for a phalloplasty. So it, basically we designed phalloplasty markings on the forearm and chose one of those incisions to go in and shorten the ulna. So that if someone would ever do a phalloplasty later using that tissue, they could reuse that incision and not have to jeopardize the skin bridge that's left over after a phalloplasty. And you're first to hear about it on Bi City. <laughs> Dr. Kim is going to write a research article on that. Oh, yes, yes, we should. Yeah, Don't we should you love do it? Where were your marketing department? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you want. But, you know, it's, it's wonderful that you have those skills that you could bring all of that knowledge and, and skill together. Yeah, yeah, I was very happy I could serve that patient. Yeah. Foresight. So we're talking about genital confirmation surgery. Could you talk a little bit more about, you know, some of the different surgeries you do and how they may be, you know, I'm sure there are a whole number of types and mm -hmm. 
different surgeons specialize in different kinds and types of them, so Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so uh, we, we, we divide up our surgeries into three main categories, facial surgeries, chest surgeries, genital surgeries, and then I guess there would be a fourth category that would include everything else. Uh, my, I specialize in genital surgery. Uh, I also do uh, chest surgery, uh, and we are looking for a plastic surgeon to do facial surgery at the University of Minnesota. When it comes to genital surgery, uh, the main feminizing surgery would be a vaginal plasty. And there are multiple ways of making that happen, uh, but the most common way uh, right now is a what we call a penile inversion vaginal plasty. So we remove all the masculine parts and use some of that tissue to create feminine vulva and, and the vagina. Mm -hmm. Uh, when it comes to masculinizing genital surgery, phalloplasty is one big component, and then there's also something called metoidioplasty. Phalloplasty is where you bring tissue in from other parts of the body to create a uh, phallus. Uh, metoidioplasty is uh, bringing tissue in from feminine genitalia to create uh, an organ you can use to urinate while standing. There are other surgeries that are involved with all this, such as hysterectomy, ophorectomy, vaginectomy, and things like that. So uh, that, would, that would be the genital side of surgery. Chest surgery would be mostly mastectomies, breast augmentation, and, and things of that sort. And facial surgery is pretty much facial feminization surgery. Facial masculinization surgery exists uh, in theory, but very few people request for those services. Mm. Mm -hmm. do, you do, do you actually do the facial feminization surgery? Or? No, I do not, okay. unfortunately. But you yeah. do chest and genitals. And I do, yes, yes. Okay. What are some of the, um, I'm just gonna say complications for lack of a better word. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, because these are delicate surgeries and, um, what, what can people expect and what, what could happen along the way here? Yes. When it comes to complications, the phalloplasty procedures have the highest rates of complications. They're mostly having to do with urethral complications. Okay. Yep. So urinating after a phalloplasty is, is a difficult thing to do. Um, there is also a flap loss complication that can happen with phalloplasty that's always uh, on our minds, uh, but thankfully because of the microsurgery literature that has grown over the past 20, 30 years, uh, those rates are much lower than the urethral complications that we see. So a flap loss, what would that entail? That would entail that we move tissue into the genital area to create a phallus and it doesn't work out with the blood supply. Okay, so it basically dies. It dies, okay. yes. Mm -hmm. Or partially dies. Partially mm -hmm. dies, mm -hmm. okay. So that would be a flap loss com complication. Okay. Mm -hmm. Urethral complications are also, in, in, in some ways, a partial flap loss complication. Uh, but it, it's, uh, it has to do with the function of urinating. And so my partner in urology, Dr. Joseph Pariser, uh, he's the one that uh, comes in and saves the day when it comes to that. Yeah. We were talking earlier about just the team of surgeons that is in the operating room when you do one of these, and just, you know, mm -hmm. eight-hour surgeries, roughly? Yes, it depends on uh, how many flaps you're harvesting okay. and how many, how many people can be working at the same time. Okay. Uh, yeah, but usually it's around six to eight to ten hours of surgery required. Wow. Yes. So I'm thinking, you know, what kind of shoes you're wearing. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were talking earlier, you know, how do you stand for eight hours and focus? And, you oh, know, and you in shift the your weight from the left foot to the right <laughs> foot. You lean back on the bed for a little <laughs> bit, yes. And if you have to, you can take a break. I mean, no one's, no one's stopping you from taking a break, yeah. Okay. So that's, that's <laughs> always... I'm to hold the phone. <laughs> I have to necessary. run out and get a cup yeah, of yes. coffee or something. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, when it comes to microsurgery, I, I try not to drink too much coffee. <laughs> But uh, yeah, that's uh, always an and option. You get the shakes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we don't want you to get the shakes. Yes, yes, exactly. Wow. Wow. Yeah. You know, I think it's worth saying maybe several times about the continuum of care spectrum that you have. 
because so mm -hmm. often in the past people I mean have gone to Thailand for genital confirmation surgery mm -hmm. and then if you run into complications who do you get mm -hmm. and they don't have all the other dermatology and you're all, I mean, all of all the folks that you have so you know that really is a, an incredibly wonderful part of your surgery because people can whatever might go on afterwards get in post-surgical care right. you can offer them Mm -hmm. right. And we welcome people to, you know, come back and get their post-operative care with us. Dr. Kim's willing to see them. Other providers in our system are to take care of our local community that choose to go somewhere else for surgery. And I would also say that, you know, a lot of trans folks don't ever want lower surgery or surgery at all. And so, you know, the diversity of gender expression and identities are, is, you know, uh, vast. And so we want to support everybody. And so, you know, our you know, gender non-binary folks who may or may not want surgery or any medical intervention, but socially transition, we, you know, we support, um, we try to support everybody. So. And I think that's worth uh, letting the general public know that so many people think that once somebody identifies as transgender that they're going to go from one gender to another. Right. And, you know, over time, I think in the professional world, and WPATH, the World Professional Association of Transgender Health, mm -hmm. you know, the, the standards have evolved. So there's mm -hmm. more of, you can be along the continuum and whatever mm -hmm. your gender expression is for whatever reason. It mm -hmm. might just be personal preference. It might be I don't have access to the money to, mm -hmm. you know, get medical interventions. But yeah. You're, yeah. you're willing and able to support all of that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And the medical records are becoming more flexible. They're not perfect, but mm -hmm. they are becoming more flexible where you know, we can support non-binary folks and, and, you know, indicate that and indicate they, them pronouns and oh, things like great. that. So, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, EJ, as a, you're the clinic coordinator, essentially, I think. Would that be the Yeah, care, care coordinator, yeah. A yeah, care, I beg your pardon, that's right. The, we're not saying clinic. <laughs> <laughs> the care coordinator. And then also, though, I mean, you have credentials as a, a master's in social work mm -hmm. and uh, a master's in um, public administration. Correct. So, got a few hats going on there. What, what can happen with somebody who calls in and begins a conversation? Is, is all of your work with your clients, patients, over the phone, or do you meet with people in person? And it seems like there's a great potential mm -hmm. uh, to use your experience to help various people. Yes, yes, thank you for the question. I, I, it depends on what the person needs. Um, if I find that we're not connecting well over the phone, um, and there is a vast of, it, you know, a lot of information that I can provide with folks, but a lot of it's difficult to maybe hear on the phone, then I can meet with individuals one-on-one. -on -one. And I can meet with them in the community or in the clinic, wherever they prefer, wherever they feel safe. Um, I go into the community to the various support groups. I identify as trans, and so I try to stay up, you know, as to what's happening in the trans community and, and connect with folks that way. Um, so it's really where you know, individuals are at and what they're comfortable with. Um, I can help with, you know, talking through insurance issues or calling insurance, calling the customer care number on the back and trying to figure out, you know, what's your deductible, explaining what a deductible is, explaining what the premium is and things like that. Um, so I just try to, you know, assess where, where and what people need and provide that service. What's your experience with uh, the kind of services that, that insurance covers these days? I mean, that's, that's evolved over time as well. So what, what are you noticing over there from your perspective? Yeah, well, um, so Medicare has expanded with the Affordable Care Act to cover um, transgender health care. They cannot discriminate based on gender identity. Um, and so that's the law, which is, which is great. So we get a lot of calls from across the nation if we take Medicare because um, it can sometimes be difficult for people in private practice to take Medicare. Um, and then in the state of Minnesota, Medicaid is expanded and also accepts or, or provides transgender health care. So um, hormones are covered, therapy is covered, um, surgical services are covered, hair removal, for surgical services are covered. We're working on facial hair uh -huh, removal. Okay. That's a little iffy right now. Um, we're working towards also getting facial feminization covered. We don't provide the service, but that's also 
um, what I hear is difficult to get covered um, through insurance. So does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. Mm -hmm. If somebody comes into the program and decides that, you know, they would like genital confirmation surgery, what are the steps that they would take? You know, I, I imagine they meet with you and with you, and then they need to get letters. And so, wa walk us through yeah. what somebody might. So I'll start, and then I'll pass it off to you. Sure. sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> so typically, I get a phone call, and I do a quick assessment, basically, you know, their transition history, and then we ask for folks to submit their two letters of support that follow the WPATH standards of care um, before we make a consultation appointment. Um, and so I work with the person um, to get that into their medical chart. I create their medical chart. Um, and then when we get the two letters of support, I schedule a consultation. And then we'll they'll come into the clinic and I'll meet with them and I talk to them. I have a, like a consultation packet and I go over the process of um, just timeline and expectations, um, answer their questions, basically put, try to put them at ease so mm -hmm. that they feel sure. like you know, when Dr. Kim comes in, I mean, he's a nice fellow, so this is nice for people to meet him here. But, you know, it's just anxiety provoking to go into a medical office and yeah. to have to show your genitals, right? Oh, and so I try to prep the person for that mm -hmm. experience and also to ensure that if they have questions, to start thinking about them and write them down if they haven't brought them with them. So, and then I pass it on to Dr. Yes, Kim. and then I will enter the room and uh, we will have a 60 minute consultation. Uh, it's, as you're aware, it's a history and physical, physical examination. And uh, then we talk about uh, what are their goals, what are sort of the goals that we uh, expect out of the procedure from a, from a surgeon's standpoint. We try to match up these goals and we talk about the risks involved and what we would do to um, get as much out of the surgery as possible. And I, I discussed with them my, my partners, so my senior partner in plastic surgery, Dr. Chowdhury, uh, my partner in urology, Dr. Pariser, and my partner in dermatology, Dr. Farah, and all the roles that they play. And then we basically send the patient back out to those specialties. They have consultations with those specialists, and then eventually they'll come back to me, and we coordinate all that care and go from there. It's amazing, and once that happens, um, how far out are you at this moment in time, knowing that that will probably change in terms of when people might actually get the surgery then? It depends on where they're at, uh, but the bottleneck that we're finding out is hair removal. Oh, we're finding okay. out, it out to be hair removal. Okay. Uh, the sessions are about four to week, six weeks apart, uh, and it takes about 12 to 14 sessions to remove the hair from the parts that I need hair removal. Okay. And so uh, some people get it, can get it done sooner than others. Some people have a harder time with hair removal, but we find that to be sort of the bottleneck. But it's not a problem. Uh, there are other things that we can work on during that, those 12 to 14 months. Mm -hmm. um, optimizing health before a big surgery is a, is a very important thing for us. Uh, when it comes to genital surgery, there is always uh, issues with urinary functioning, and so we want to make sure that all that is teased out before we commit to surgery. Mm -hmm. Do you have any weight restrictions in terms of uh, pe people that are going through feminization, genital confirmation yes. surgery? Yes, when it comes to genital surgery, we do uh, have harder weight restrictions. Uh, these weight restrictions uh, are overlooked if the surgery, if, if the body habitus down in that area is amenable to surgery. Uh, but with a higher weight, there are increased risks of things such as infection, wound healing problems, and, and so forth that are very difficult to treat down in, in the perineal region. With that said, there is a very prominent surgeon out in Portland, Oregon, who is kind of uh, challenging that concept. Okay. Mm -hmm. And at the University of Minnesota, we also want to be uh, cut, cutting edge. And so okay. uh, with more and more people challenging these ideas, we also want to be a part of that as well. Uh, but uh, safety is first. 
Right, mm -hmm. right, I can tell it. We're down to about two minutes. And I'm just, you know, every, uh, for the last four times when you have asked a question, I was ready too with, with the question, and fortunately at least one or we'll two of them were the same question. Oh, wonderful. But it's like there's, the, the more you speak, the more there is to ask about right. and be interested in. And so I'm thinking like, shall we wrap things up or, you know, I give say, them? ask you to say whatever you would like to say to our audience that maybe we haven't covered. One, one minute, mm -hmm. I yeah. would say. Mm -hmm. I would say if you're questioning, um, have concerns, is to call um, to look up our program on mhealth.org, um, the Comprehensive Gender Care Program. The phone number's on there um, to, to give me a call, and I'll answer the questions as best as I can and, and get people the most information because there are a lot of questions um, and a lot of information to provide, and it's, it's a process. All of this is a process, and so. I agree with EJ. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to thank you again for taking time out of your very busy schedules oh, hmm. to come and be on By Cities. EJ My Jack, pleasure. who's the care coordinator, Dr. Nicholas Kim, who's a surgeon at the University of Minnesota Comprehensive Gender Care Institute. Thank you for joining us, and would you please join us now in our signature goodbye? Mm -hmm. Yes, of course. Is, All right. Bye. Peace and camera three. Bye. Bye for, Bye for now. now. Bye for now.